Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Darren Finling, and I am one of Fred Finling's sons, um, and who sits to my left. Uh, this is a uh, rather extraordinary moment for our family, uh, because this is actually my father's first time ever actually formally telling his life story. Uh, so you're in for a very compelling uh, piece of history from somebody who actually survived the Holocaust. Uh, it's very important as part of the education for you to also hear from living survivors, people who bared witness to this atrocity. And uh, this is a pretty extraordinary moment for our family uh, because during our lifetime we heard vignettes, stories, little snippets, and for the first time today we're going to hear a story, his, his life story, uh, put together. We're extraordinary, extraordinarily proud of our father, and uh, I want to welcome my father, Fred Finling, here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for showing up this afternoon. It's um, an unusual day for me. If I uh, sometimes, if I sometimes choke up or break up, please forgive me, but um, I'm prepared to tell you my early history. I, <coughs> I was born in Cologne, Germany, on December 4, 1930, the third of five children. My name in Germany was Siegfried, not Fred. A name that came out of German mythology. Siegfried was the legendary dragon slayer. My, my father and mother were born in Poland and came to Germany after World War I. They were never allowed to become citizens in Germany. My family lived in a Jewish section in Cologne, not far from the center of the city. My father was an itinerant worker and from time to time worked in a lumber yard. Most of the time we were assisted by Jewish charity. We were a religious family and spoke both Yiddish, which is the language of Jewish people, and German at home. The western part of Germany was a demilitarized zone and the Nazis did not occupy it until March 1936, when Hitler marched in with his army. I was five years old at that time. Life became very difficult, dangerous, and uncomfortable for the Jews. I'd like to digress a little bit and teach you, or let you know at least, a little bit about history. After World War I, the armistice, the western part of Germany was declared a demilitarized zone which means the army, German army could not enter that part of the German country. Hitler, despite the advice of his generals, decided to go into the western part of Germany and occupy it. And the French had the capacity and wherewithal to stop them. They were, they, the French army outnumbered the Germans by at least 20 to 1. But Hitler went ahead and did it. And the reason by history that we know now that the French army didn't stop it is because the government thought it was too expensive. If the French army had stopped Hitler, that would have been the end of Hitler. He would have had to dog tail it back to Berlin and probably would have been kicked out of office and history would not be what it is today. Hitler wrote a book in 1925 called Mein Kampf. In it, he said that the German man was a super race, six feet tall, with fair skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. He used the Scandinavian man as the ideal for the Aryan race. He referred to Jews. Now, this comes out of Mein Kampf, these words that I'm going to tell you. He referred to Jews as parasites, liars, dirty, crafty, sly, wily, clever, 
without any true culture, a sponger, a middleman, a maggot, eternal bloodsuckers, repulsive, unscrupulous monsters, foreign, menace, bloodthirsty, avaricious, the destroyer of, and the mortal enemy of the Aryan humanity. A dog was worth more than a Jew. Copies of this book were given to every high school graduate, every married couple, and as gifts. Nobody bothered ever to read the book because it was not readable. We Jews in Germany lived with this atmosphere of state-sponsored anti-Semitism. In 1935, anti-Semitic laws were passed known as the Nuremberg Laws, which relegated Jews to untermenschen, subhumans, and denied them German citizenship. These laws allowed Jews to become dispossessed, their property taken away without payment, alienated and publicly assaulted without fear of punishment or retribution. Laws were passed restricting our movements. We were not allowed to go into public schools. I was kicked out of one. Public parks and to commence or do commerce with Germans. I was kicked out of my, I myself was kicked out of public school in my second grade. Signs were posted everywhere which stated, don't buy from Jews. Kauf nicht vom Juden. Anti-Semitism became government sponsored. It even existed in songs. Listen to this. The Hitler Youth Marching Song had this lyric, lyric Mit Juden's Blut vom Messer spritzt, which translates with Jewish blood splashing from a knife. The German salute with the right arm raised, as you've seen here, Sieg Heil, Hail Victory, or Heil Hitler, Hail Hitler. In the streets, Frequently, I was yelled at by German kids who chased after me and threw, threw stones or rocks. They would call me Schweinehund, verdammte Jude, and other demeaning expressions. I was made to feel inferior. I started to have nightmares every night. The same one every day of images I could never recall but always recognized. One day, my father decided to take his young family to a public park called Volksgarten in Cologne, Germany. Even though it was prohibited for Jews to go there, he was discovered by two Gestapo men. The men threw him into the lake and attempted to drown him. At the last moment, they were stopped by their superior. We shook like leaves from fright and were helpless to do anything about it. I became good at dodging stones thrown by young German kids, chasing me down the streets who claimed to recognize me by the shape of my nose. The Germans claimed that all Jews had crooked noses. One time an SS man passing out propaganda leaflets handed one to Joseph, my older brother. He was nine years old at the time. When he refused to accept it, the SS man took out a revolver, a revolver and pointed it at my brother's head. He pulled the trigger and the gun clicked. He said that next time you refuse to accept a leaflet, the gun will be loaded. <coughs> when Hit whenever Hitler spoke, which was often, loudspeakers at every street corner blared away, and all people stopped to listen. All traffic ceased moving. His ranting and ravings always included his hatred for Jews, whom he blamed for all the German sufferings. I grew up with an inferiority complex. My ego was constantly under attack. I was led to believe that I was unworthy. But my name was Siegfried, and I was a dragon slayer. And the mythological secret was ein stolzer Knab, a proud youth. The association of my given name with the dragon slayer gave me inner strength and allowed me to persevere. In October 1938, Hitler ordered all foreign-born Polish men to leave Germany. Even those that had lived in Germany for almost 20 years. My father was ordered to report to the police station, together with my mother's younger brother, Uncle Haskell, and 16,000 other Polish men. 16,000. They were put on trains and deported. This was the first ethnic cleansing of World War II. 
On the way to the police station, my father told my older brother Joseph, who was then 10 years old, you are now in charge of the family. The Germans believed that if they paid for the deportation of the men only, the rest of the family would follow and pay their own way to leave. This was the last time that I saw my father alive. I was just short. I was just short of my eighth birthday. My uncle Haskell Gottesdien who survived the war and related the story of what happened next. The men were only allowed a loaf of bread and the equivalent of ten dollars. Before leaving, he secretly sewed extra paper money into the lining of his jacket and that of my father. Two days later, when the trains arrived at the border, everybody had to detrain and stand in front of the boxcars. Nazis with, with vicious dogs, German Shepherd dogs, asked each person how much money they had. Anyone who had more than the money allowed was viciously beaten on the spot, ripped apart by the dogs, and left to die. A man near my father suffered that fate. My father started to shake and tremble. Uncle Haskell grabbed my father's wrist and with his nails squeezed so hard that blood flowed out. My father answered the Nazis' question correctly and was passed by. After being held at the border for two days, the Polish government finally let the men enter the country. My father made his way back to Fristak, his home village, and my uncle Haskell, Haskell used the secretly hidden money to buy a, a boat ticket to London, England. He eventually was drafted in the British Army, fought in the war, changed his name, anglicized it, from Haskell Gottesdiener to Charles Gordon, married, had children, and lived to a ripe old age. One month later, one month after the deportation of the Polish Jews was Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht, which is named after the night of the broken glass, lasted two days. November 9th and 10th, 1938. The Germans used wooden banisters to break store windows and beat up Jews. I remember coming home from school, and that is I went to a Jewish school after I was kicked out of German school, and passed by a synagogue where all of the holy books and Torah scrolls were thrown in a large mound and burned in a bonfire. And the synagogue was torched. A Nazi shot the Morgan David, that's the Star of David, off the roof. That night, the Nazis went door to door to beat up Jews. They came pounding on our apartment door. My brothers and the sisters and I hid under the bed. My brother Joseph put his hand over the mouth of my baby sister Regina, who was only 18 months old, to stop her from crying. He almost choked her to death. After a long while, what seemed like eternity, the pounding stopped and they went away. My mother then said, it started to make plans that we had to leave the country. We had to leave the country. My brother Joseph, who was only 10 years old, attempted to board a train to see if he could get us into Holland. He went by himself. He told us that he hid underneath a woman's skirt to try and get into the Holland, Holland country, but he was discovered and returned home. My mother then came up with another plan. She contacted relatives in Brussels, Belgium, and arranged for a cousin to take a train to the Belgian-German border. The cousin would arrive at Erbestal, which is the Belgian side of the border, and separately, we, my brother Joseph, my sister Fanny, my younger brother Martin, and I would leave Cologne and then attempt to enter Belgium. The Germans wanted the Jews out of the country, so the exiting was not a problem. The real problem was the Belgian crossing guards. The plan was that when we arrived at the Belgian border, my cousin would board the train and try to talk the border crossing guard into letting us in. In November 1938, 
we boarded a train in Cologne. We successfully crossed the German border and met our cousin at Erbestal. She sweet-talked the guard into letting us in. My mother and baby sister, Regina, stayed behind to sell our belongings. A few months later, Belgium closed, also closed its borders to prevent further immigration by escaping Jews. Another cousin by the name of Hermann Rembelinski paid a German smuggler a lot of money, the equivalent of what is now $25,000, to smuggle my mother and baby sister into Belgium. Once in Belgium, I was placed in three different orphanages, one of which was Catholic, and I learned how to do the litany in French. In September 1939, I ended up at a Jewish boy's orphanage called Foyer des Orphelins in Brussels, Belgium. My brother Joseph and Martin joined me. My sister Fanny went to live with my mother and sister Regina also in an apartment in Brussels. Sometimes I saw them on Sundays. In May 1940, the Germans invaded the Netherlands and Belgium and France. And I have to digress a little from my story to tell you what the, the circumstances of how they were able to get into France. We were in Belgium and years before, in the 30s, France built a defense line called the Maginot Line and the Germans built a defense line called the Siegfried Line, same as my name and they faced each other. And the reason they did that is because the French mentality was that in World War I they had what they call a static war, a trench war, where thousands of men would go over the trenches and try and fight the enemy, the Germans, in their trenches. And they thought that the war would be the same. But the Germans, the Germans had different ideas and plans. They modernized their army, they mechanized it, they built tanks, planes, fast-moving fast troops, and instead of going through the Maginot Line when they attacked France, they went through Belgium, where there was no defense line. They went right through my country into France. We were, while they were attacking Belgium, Holland, and France, we were constantly under bombing attacks and hid in the basement. I constantly thought that the next bomb would be a direct hit, and I would disappear. It was a relief when the all-clear siren wailed. I saw many dogfights up above. On the day before the Germans entered Brussels, my whole orphanage and the girls' orphanage, totaling about 100 children, ranging in age from 3 to 16, went to the train station, the Gare du Nord in, in Brussels, and boarded the last three boxcars of a train leaving the city the day before the Germans entered Brussels. The boxcars had no windows and all, all of us slept on wooden floors. They were called in French, quarante hommes et huit chevaux, which translates to 40 men and eight horses. These were boxcars that were used by the French in World War I, which carried 40 men and eight horses. We had no food or water. The boys could relieve themselves by sliding open the doors. The girls had to wait until the train stopped somewhere. We were on that train zigzagging through the French countryside for five days. The little food we received was from sympathetic French people who approached the train when it stopped. We arrived at the outskirts of Paris and saw the city being bombed and strafed. I remember the balloons. They had, French had balloons up there with wires hanging down to entangle German fighter planes. It seemed like the whole city was lit up from the fires and bombs falling. This all from the train I was on. After five days of traveling, we finally stopped at a city called Villefranche, not far from Toulouse in the south of France. From there we took trucks to a little village called Serre. We, nobody knows Serre, so they always refer to it near the largest city, city there. We call it Serre Panayou. The population of Serre was around 100. We doubled it. We were housed in an old abandoned granary and slept on hay. The southern part of France was not yet occupied by the invading German army, 
but was under the control of the collaborating Vichy government under Marshal Pétain. He was a French general of World War I, and he collaborated with the Germans to help the Germans so the Germans didn't have to occupy the southern part of France until 1942, but the French government aided the Germans in rounding up Jews. We all scrounged for food whenever we could find it. I once remember in this village asking a smithy for food and he handed me a piece of toast, completely burned through, which I devoured with pleasure. The Swiss Red Cross located us and started helping out. They brought us cots and blankets and supplied us with wooden shoes called sabots. You've probably seen them if you visited Holland, Michigan, the wooden shoes. Most of our meals consisted of a corn mush called mamalega and fruits and vegetables. Our leader was the husband and head of the girls' orphanage. His name is Alex Frank. He was in charge, besides several older women who, who were with us. After we, arrived for, uh, after we arrived, for about six weeks, the French army was also stationed there waiting for demobilization. The Germans had conquered France and the French army was being demobilized. Hundreds of soldiers sat around making fancy belts out of their gun belts and carved fancy wooden canes. We were forbidden to speak any German. Any time anyone was caught, it was, he was put on bread and water for eight days. I was one of the unlucky ones and it was put on bread and water for that time. Our heads were shaved because of an infestation of fleas. We did our best to make life out of the difficult circumstances. We had no schooling. The winter of 1940-41 was harsh and severe. We prepared for it by knitting sweaters and scarves. I became very adept at knitting. I survived the bitter cold with short pants, wooden shoes, wool sweater, and a scarf. At the end of 1940, the French police started rounding up Jewish men and boys 16 years and over. Alex Frank started looking for another hiding place deeper into the mountains and located an abandoned 15th century castle in the foothills of the Pyrenees in southern France called Chateau de la Hy. It had no electricity, running water, or toilets. We all moved into the castle. A large hole was dug into the ground and wooden shed was built over it to act as a toilet. After several days, the hole was completely filled with worms, thousands of them. The older boys installed electricity. We planted food on land surrounding the castle and the other children helped the neighboring farmers to earn extra food. There was never enough food to eat. And I remember digging up raw potatoes and onions every day to try and survive. Fruits and vegetables from neighboring fields also helped. We were allowed two pieces of bread with jam for breakfast. This had to last us until supper. My younger brother, Martin, was only allowed one because he was younger. He was a kvetch, if you know what that means. He complained to me that he was always hungry. I gave him my second slice of bread. We also had a cup of milk daily, no seconds. One day I accidentally spilled my cup and lost all my milk. There remained only a little bit in the bottom of the cup. I licked the milk with the tip of my tongue until the milk was gone. That is the way we survived. In 1941, Eleanor Roosevelt, wife of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, started a program called Save the Children, hoping to rescue 10,000 Jewish children from the war in Europe. The American Quaker organization opened eight offices in different European cities to process the applicants and then have them come to the United States. All one needed was parental consent to travel there. My brother Joseph wrote to our father in Poland and our mother in Belgium. There was no direct communication. You couldn't write directly. But communication was still possible through the Swiss Red Cross, who re redirected the mail to the address C. Both of my parents provided written permission to escape to America, knowing that they may, ne men may never see us again. In July 1941, my brothers Joseph, Martin, and I 
along with 20 other children, went by train to Marseille, France. We were processed by the American Quakers and given a tag to wear around our neck. This was our passport. From Marseille, we took a train through Spain to Lisbon, Portugal. At the border with Spain, in the middle of the night, we had to change trains because the Spanish rails are different. My younger brother Martin, again, was half asleep and lost his way. I eventually found him and made sure he boarded the right train. We joined up with children from other hiding places and around 50 of us in the middle of September 1941 boarded the SS Serpa Pinto, a Portuguese freight boat in Lisbon, Portugal. Now, again, this was a Portuguese flagged ship, but it was really originally a British ship that was sold to Portugal. So crossing the Atlantic was fraught with danger because of the German U-boats. We, what ordinarily would take five, six days to cross, took us two weeks of zigzagging across the Atlantic. And we even spotted a German U-boat near, um, we spot, in, near the United States, we spotted a U-boat. But fortunately, we, they, they probably didn't think we were important enough to torpedo us. We finally arrived in New York on September 24, 1941. We passed the Statue of Liberty and stayed on Ellis Island before being allowed entry. We were finally safe. Of the 10,000 children that Eleanor Roosevelt wanted to save, only 200 were saved. My boat was the last one to arrive before the U.S. entered the war. For many years after World War II, I had no official knowledge of the fate of my parents. I wrote to the Red Cross and received a reply indicating, indicating that they had disappeared. As a young adult, I traveled to Europe many times to reunite with my Uncle Charles in London and my cousins in Belgium who survived the war. I always imagined that someday I would meet my parents and show them what I had accomplished in my life. I knew they would be proud of me. In 1977, when I was 46 years old in Jerusalem, Israel, at Yad Vashem, I learned of my mother's death, 34 years after she was murdered. I read a book written by Serge Klarsfeld and Maxine Steinberg entitled Memorial to the Deportation of Belgian Jews. In 1943, my mother and my two sisters, Fanny and Regina, were still in hiding in Brussels, just like Anne Frank. My mother was discovered by the Nazis and on, Jan on July 31st, shipped by train with over 1,000 others to Auschwitz and immediately gassed upon arrival on August 2, 1943. The Germans were excellent record keepers. They listed everyone by name who was on every transport of the 23 transport, she was listed in transport number 21. In the book, she was listed on the 21st transport that left Belgium for Auschwitz. There were 23 transports totaling 25,000 Jews that were shipped from Belgium to Auschwitz. Most of the deported Jews were murdered at Auschwitz upon arrival. After my mother was arrested, deported and gassed at Auschwitz, my two sisters, Fanny and Regina, were hidden in a Catholic convent in Belgium and survived the war. When they were rediscovered by my surviving cousins, Fanny had already taken her first vows to become a nun. On a weekend visit outside the convent, she was secretly spirited out of Belgium and sent to London, England, to my uncle Charles Gordon. It took him six weeks to deprogram her and have her return to her Jewish upbringings. The Catholic Church sued my cousins to get her back, claiming that our mother was the only person who could claim custody. The lawsuit died a natural death when our sisters came to America in 1948. I learned officially of my father's death from my daughter, who visited Frischtag, Poland in May 1992. I was 62 years old. 
My daughter located the Jewish place where my father's where he th she thought my father's grave was. Without success, she asked many elderly residents about my father. She discovered a Christian friend of my father, a childhood friend, who confirmed the fate of the Jews that were in Frischtag, Poland. He said that sometime in 1941, my father and everybody in his village and surrounding areas were rounded up by the Nazis. Over 5,000 of them were shot and killed in a mass grave in a killing field. Many years later, the Polish government built a memorial to the killing fields. I've had the opportunity to pray for my parents at their graves. Three years ago, my wife, my son David, and I flew to Poland and visited Auschwitz and Frischstag. At Auschwitz, we lit a yardside candle, that's a memorial candle, for my parents at the side of the destroyed crematorium and said, Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. At Frischstag, we visited the grave where my father was shot and we fixed an inscribed plaque for a tombstone and also lit yardside candles and said Kaddish. I have finally come to accept my parents' death. And I have closure. I am now at peace with myself. Hitler killed six million Jews in World War II. He tried to kill me but he didn't succeed. He robbed me of my childhood, but not my life. My success story is a form of revenge to the maniacal philosophy of Hitlerism. I now have a large and adoring family. I have six children and a wonderful wife named Luba. Three of my sons are attorneys and practice with me in Royal Oak. My daughter Debbie has a PhD in education and is the assistant director of the Goldman Fund, a large charity foundation in San Francisco, California. I have another daughter, Tamara, who is a psychology senior at Wayne State and plans to get a PhD. And lately I have a son, Tim, who wants to become a lawyer also, like his brother and father. I have 11 grandchildren and hope to have more. I came to this country at the end of 1941, almost 11 years old, a tiny kid, just a child a little over four feet tall and weighing 57 pounds. I had nothing but the clothes on my back. I grew up without a childhood. I knew though that by hard work and struggle I could succeed in life. I believe I did, for you see, I am Siegfried the Dragon Slayer. I think this is the time for questioning. If you have any questions, I'm going to try and answer them. Yes, either. Were you scared? I'm sorry? Were you scared? Always. I was always scared. Can you imagine what it's like to be scared 24 hours a day without end, knowing that um, you are treated as if you were worth less than a dog and that anybody could harm you and there would be no accountability. The person that did that to you would not be punished. Can you imagine that? Impossible. Is it? Um, as a sideline, I'd like to add this, it's not part of my speech, but the after Crystal Night, the insurance industry said, how are we going to pay all these claims? You just, to the Germans, to Hitler, how are, you, how are we going to pay all these claims? You destroyed all the property, the stores, your synagogues, all these places are insured, how are we going to pay for how are you gonna? How are we going to pay for them? And you know what Hitler said? The Jews brought it on to themselves. You don't have to pay the claims. In other words, none of them were ever paid. This is part of the history. Any other questions? Yes. What was your, what was your life like after you came to America? I'm sorry? What was your life like after you came to America? Like what happened to you when you 
You want to know about that too? <laughs> well, not good. Uh, I was, uh, I first, the first four years I lived with uh, a German family who uh, immigrated here. They didn't have any children and uh, he fought in World War I on the side of Germany and he was Jewish, but um, they were still very regimented, strict, um, very, I was very unhappy there. Then I went in the boarding house and I stayed in the boarding house with 15 other children for two years. And then uh, one year after that, I went to live with an American family for one year. Then I, I uh, when I was 18, I went to Wayne and uh, I got the, in that time they had dormitories. I got the housing counselor to allow me to have a room there if I could get a job. And I said, I didn't have a job. So they called downstairs and they got me a job in the candy counter. So I had a, a job and I had to work at the candy counter and they gave me uh, food ticket to uh, supplement the candy, I mean the, the money I was making, which is 50 cents an hour. <laughs> but uh, I took any job I could get, you know, washing dishes, uh, mopping floors. You do what you do, what is necessary to survive. But um, it was a struggle. Um, I would, uh, I never had enough food. And I would, uh, for instance, you could, um, <coughs> You could get ketchup for free, and hot water for free, and crackers for free. So I take ketchup, put hot water in it, and made a soup out of it. And, and the crackers were helped me fill up. Um, for instance, there was a bakery, a, a Bond Bakery, I think, uh, near downtown. At the end of the day, you could go there and get uh, a loaf of bread for half price. So, uh, and I could get a chocolate cel celery to. Uh, eat, so I had bread and celery, and I lived off that. So you, you, you survive, and uh, I survived. I went to uh, college for seven years on my own without a scholarship, just working, sometimes two or three jobs at the same time, and I became a lawyer. And then after I became a lawyer, things got easier. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, what is your attitude toward German? I mean, you went back to Germany to make those, those stops, and, but how do you feel about Germany nowadays? Well, it, it, it's it's a very very complex complex question. There, you, if you talk about the old Germans, they haven't changed. Germans, my generation, um, I can tell you what the, the, my first experience with them when I went back to visit Germany back in 1958. They were very regimented people. They loved authority, you know, the Führer, the leader. Um, everybody liked uniforms. In fact, even the garbage collectors had uniforms. <laughs> yeah, and they, they, they all wanted to be regimented. And uh, for instance, um, give you a simple example. When I first arrived, I stayed at the youth hostel in Germany. and. Uh, as an American, you know, we like to sleep in. You know, <laughs> in the morning, you don't want to have to get up. When I woke up at seven o'clock, all the Germans were there, out there, already doing exercise, Einstein, Einstein, regimented together. And then they came in, everybody was polishing their shoes. This is the type of regimented, uh, regimented lives they had. Um, they were, the German mentality was that you had to go to whatever extreme is necessary to get to the truth. For instance, when we have an accident here, automobile accident, you know, you go to the police station, make a police report, and he says this and she says that, and that's it, you know, you make a report. In Germany, no. When you have, a, when you have a, had an accident in those days, I don't know what it is now, I haven't been there for many years, but in those days when you had an accident, traffic stopped. They came out, they took, Tape measures measured the distances. They wanted to know exactly the distances. They wanted to see the debris. They took pictures. All traffic stopped until the investigation was complete, no matter what the damage was. This is German. And I can tell you more and more, but the idea was the German people of my generation, and even many years later, 
were people that believed in a leadership, believed in a strong leader. Um, they believed in being regimented. They believed in, um, I suppose, they didn't have this give and take that we had. Now, I'll give you another example, just to give you to illustrate um, what I'm talking about. I once came back from Belgium, uh, visit, going back from, German, from Belgium into Belgium, uh, in, from Belgium into Germany. And I was on a train. I had befriended the German that was coming back. And he was worried that he, the, the, his cigarettes that he had would be confiscated. He said, uh, and then when we got to the German custom, the customs man came up and said, Verboten, can't bring it in. So anyways, I took one pack, I ripped open the carton, took one pack, ripped open a pack, I uh, ripped open one uh, package of cigarettes, took one out and gave it to the, my friend, and he said, it's used, you can't tax him, he can take it with it. And you should see how that customs man glared at me. He was ready to, to kill me if he could, but I was right. You see, now, as, as an American, you always look for flexibility, being able to adopt, to, to adjust. The Germans, everything had to be right. Everything had to be conformed to the statute, the laws, the regulations, whatever it is. That was Germany. And, it is, and I'm not sure what it is now, but it was like that for many years after World War II. Any other questions? Trey, with your horribly disrupted childhood life, how much of a, an elementary education were you able to up, obtain and put together? Not much. <laughs> Um, when I came here, the, um, I went to a special school, at special classes at Hutchins Elementary School, and they put me in the fifth grade, and I was a half year, fortunately, I only wound up being a half year behind. So I was able to catch up. I was fortunate, only half, half year behind. But at one time, this is interesting, <laughs> at one time I spoke three languages. And I still speak three, but I spoke all three languages, and I had an accent each one. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have accents in each. I think my name is very recognizable, even though I try to speak without too much of an accent. Any any other? Yes. Is there somebody that stands out to you as in all of those different travels on the trains and through the different countries that? You know, cause as we went through our tour, he talked a lot about the people that helped. Yes. Um, so is there somebody in particular that stands out for you? Yes, Alex Frank. I mentioned him, I think, in my story. Alex Frank um, was a Belgian. He was in the Belgian military. And uh, when we left, he was actually, the, his wife was in charge of the girls' home. And he came along with us, and he wound up being in charge of all of us. And he was in his 30s. And uh, he actually kept us, in many respects, um, pretty safe. And it turned out after, and the interesting thing about his life, he, after we came to the United States, um, the Germans overran southern France. and. I didn't mention this in the story, but out of the hundred children that were there, 90 survived. 90 survived. Um, some were able to get into Spain, some got into Switzerland, some joined the, the underground, but 90 survived and they spread out throughout the world. And uh, he was able to escape, make his way to Great Britain. He wound up in the British, uh, in the British Air Force. And he fought for the Germans in the British Air Force. After the war, uh, for some reason, he wound up in Eastern Germany, and we lost contact with him until the 80s. And then we had a reunion um, when he was already in his 80s, and he called us his brothers and sisters when he was in his 80s. Yes, David. Can you tell the story about the reunion that you attended? In Belgium? Well, the, uh, in, no, in Chicago? The Chicago reunion. The Chicago, you tell us. <laughs> you have <laughs> my oldest son, David. David, come on up well, and do you okay. tell the story. Just, uh, I'm not going to usurp what my father said, but um, I had the privilege of meeting Alex Frank. And uh, my oldest son, Noah, his middle name is Alexander. He's named after Alex Frank. And 
there was a, uh, a special on TV from Lifetime that they had put together this reunion show. And the reunion show uh, included the children of Lai. Right. And uh, these, it, it seemed that the, the, the kids, these were children who are now in their 70s. Um, one guy stands out to me, his name was Fred Manassi. Okay, Still remember his name. And he came up to my father and he was telling us how he didn't want to come. He really had such hard feelings from his life. And uh, he had brought a picture. He said he has really special memories of playing with these little boys. My father said, well, show me the picture. Who, maybe we can figure out who they are. And he pulled out the picture and he said, that's me. That's my brother Joe, and that's my brother Martin. That's true. He had a picture with him for all these years, and he uh, always wanted to know who the three boys were that he played with when he was young. It turned out to be my brother and I. But anyways, um, Alex, they, they, my story is not is unique to me, but it's more or less representative of every survivor. Every survivor has their own tale, their own tragedy. Um, I have to admit that I was able, as you can see, put the past in its proper place. I don't dwell on the past. I have a wonderful life now. I have a wonderful family. I have a wonderful wife. And I have many children and grandchildren. And the past is history. And I've made up for the lack of childhood that I have because I made sure that my children had a great childhood. And my children now make sure that my grandchildren have a great childhood. So the deprivation that I suffered has been more and more remedied by the lives my children and grandchildren live. I think what is important by my presentation is that it's not to dwell on what my experiences are, but I think more important to show how man can become inhuman, how a person like Adolf Hitler was ever able to come into a country that has such a wonderful history, such a wonderful, wonderful cultural past, and be able to take over that country and demonize that country and also try to use that country as a catapult to conquer the world. And he used the Jews as a scapegoat to perpetrate his goal. As you can see, the things that I said about Hitler wanting to call the German people the Aryan race and trying to emulate the Scandinavian type, that the Germans were all tall, blonde, blue-eyed, uh, that no German, you, you're not going to find many Germans that look like that. But that was Hitler's model for the German Aryan. And it, it was really, you wonder now when you look back, how could this ever happen? How could it ever happen in a country as civilized as Germany? But it did. It did. And I think if there's anything to be learned from this experience is that we and our children and our children's children should make sure that this will never, ever happen again. And if there is any moral to the story, it is to make sure that we pass on the history of what happened during the Holocaust to our children and our grandchildren and let them learn what man can do if he is given the chance to be inhuman. Thank you very much.